During my time both as a personal trainer and fitness content creator, I've reviewed hundreds, if not thousands, of people's exercise form. They send in videos, I give my thoughts and feedback. It's cool and I hope I can help them. But I've noticed a consistent misunderstanding on what perfect exercise form is. And it applies to beginners, as you might think, but it also applies to some very advanced people, and you might see why in a second. Because it's pretty clear that exercise form is important, right? It's one of the first things I ask to see if someone tells me they aren't making progress like they want to be. If their sleep is good and their eating habits are aligned with their goals, then then usually the next thing I want to see is their exercise form. Because if your biomechanics are off, sometimes you just won't make progress. Or more accurately, you're making progress a lot slower than you have the potential for. Because your body is smart, it can adapt, it can get stronger, it can change. And in fitness, proper exercise form is how we ask our body to make the changes we want to get stronger and bigger in the right places. And because of that, I do think many people recognize the importance of exercise form. Rightly so, right? If you hire a good personal trainer, one of the things they'll talk to you about is exercise form. And it's even talked about in some gym classes. So even if you're not really into fitness, you may have heard things like, don't flare your elbows too much during push-ups, don't round your back during deadlifts. You may have even heard, don't go knees over toes during squats. And what we've come to realize over time is none of those things are necessarily wrong, nor are they necessarily right. It depends on what you want to do. It depends on what you're trying to do. And you'll see this in people who've exercised for years, professional athletes even. If you look up record deadlifts and you look at some videos of that, you may notice that some of them slightly round their back when they're lifting the weight. And if you look at the comment sections, you might think, well, are they all just ego lifting? This is unsafe, right? Does this Olympic gold medalist not even know the basics of fitness? And I mean, I don't know if they know the basics because I'm not them. But I do know that in fitness, like many other endeavors, when we're starting out, we're usually given a basic structure of what to follow. Here's what to do, and here's why to do it, maybe. And as we get more advanced, we realize we can tweak these options. We can tweak the structure based on what we want. And we realize that ideal technique depends on your training goals. So it's not so much whether you have perfect form for any given exercise, but whether you have proper intentional form. And it's both easy and difficult to tell because while you can make some adjustments, world-class athletes still hire coaches to help them train. But here's some things you can keep in mind. Okay, first let's use pull-ups as an example, and I'll demonstrate on this playground equipment because it was either this or a tree. When I first started doing pull-ups, I did this hollow body or straight body pull-ups like so. And I thought this was perfect form because I made the mistake of thinking this looked the best, so it has to be perfect. And it does have good transfer to things like muscle ups, weighted pull ups, even climbing in a way. But there's also another way to do pull ups where you see some people lean back and go like this, almost like a row. Now, I don't know the first time I saw someone do this, but I remember thinking that it was really ugly looking and I was thinking there's no way that that can be right. This is before I did fitness seriously or anything. But as it turns out, obviously there's nothing wrong with it. A lot of very strong people do this. There is a little bit less core engagement, but there's more upper and mid back engagement, especially at the top half. And while I find this variation to be a little harder to add weight to, it just feels like there's a little bit more pressure on the lower back, I do recommend learning it still. Some people find it a little bit easier to feel the muscles in their back in this position. And in fact, one of the most common form cues, a good one to pull your scapula back and down, seems to incline you for this position. And while it's not necessary to have to feel your muscles at all times, arch back pull-ups do seem to be more common for people who are interested in growing muscle. So you can see from this pull-up example that there's different variations of form, different types of exercise that vary based on what you're trying to do. But let's talk about a little bit more of a controversial one. By the way, I'm really impressed that I remembered to go underneath because it totally seems like me to bump my head on this and go, ah, on camera. The behind the neck pull-up is sometimes thought to be dangerous and some trainers will tell you not to do it. And there's an important lesson I'd like to share here because the first time I did one was about 20 years ago or so and I felt fine after doing it. But later that night, the next morning and a few days after, my shoulders hurt. And you would think that would mean not to do this exercise, right? Because we don't want to do something that hurts us. We want to get stronger with exercise, not weaker. Well, the lessons I've learned since then is that almost all human movement can be scaled. Meaning this, and this is quite handy that this is nice and low so I can just whoop like that. But this doesn't hurt me. If I take a broom handle and go like this, it also doesn't hurt me. So why would adding my body weight hurt? And for me, the realization now is that while back then I was strong enough to do regular pull-ups, I wasn't strong enough to support my body weight in this position. And I probably lack strength and shoulder mobility. But these are all things that can be increased and strengthened. And we all know this concept with things like dumbbells and barbells, but it seems to be especially confusing for body weight exercises and calisthenics because we seem to either be using nothing 
or our body weight, which can sometimes be a couple hundred pounds for some of us. So if we were just training this movement on a machine or with weights, we'd probably start at a few pounds, 40 pounds, 50 pounds, 60 pounds, something we can handle quite easily. And as we're stronger, including at the parts where I got injured, we would add on weight over time instead of just jumping to body weight like this. And thank you to whoever built this playground for letting me use it. I'm actually not completely sure if I'm allowed to be here. I probably am. And we can also use push-ups as an example. By the way, this can also apply to bench press, pull downs, or whatever gym equivalent that you want. I'm just showing calisthenics because it's in the name. And I should sometimes talk about calisthenics. We talk about some things that are only tangentially related to fitness. But for pushing motions in general, I'll talk about elbow flare position, the position of your shoulder blades, and I'll even talk about elbow bend. So if you spend any time reading about push-ups, watching people talk about push-ups, or just watching people do push-ups, you may notice there's some variance and some variety in how much chicken wing we have, so how much elbow flare we have. Some people do push-ups with their elbows pretty much by their sides, like so, and this will work the shoulders more. But some advise about 30 degrees or 45 degrees going like so. And you'll hear different reasonings for why people do this. Some people say it's unsafe to flare too much. I used to also think that, but really they just emphasize slightly different muscle groups. Push-ups will pretty much work your chest, arms, shoulders, no matter what, but shoulders by your side, usually more shoulders and triceps involvement as you push and out flaring a little bit more, 30, 45 degrees, that area, you'll have more chest involvement. And an easy way you can test this for yourself is just to remove the elbow bend, stand up like this, and you can feel your shoulder flex here. You can feel it moving. Do you feel your chest? Not quite as much, maybe a little bit of movement, but as you flare out a little bit more, you'll notice there's a little bit more engagement here. And this is related to another form cue, similar to the one for pull-ups, which is also good for push-ups, especially if you have trouble feeling your chest, which is to bring your shoulders back and down. And if you have trouble feeling your chest, also flare out a little bit and go down in this position. And as you push up, focus on bringing your elbows together. It's a good form cue for people who have trouble feeling their chest during push-ups. And if you tried that and it works, the elbow thing isn't magic. I think it just makes us focus on moving our upper arms above the elbow, which is really what our chest is moving. Then our triceps will dominate our movement below the elbow. And that is, once again, yet another thing that we can control during push-ups. So hopefully you're seeing here that none of these are necessarily wrong or right. They just work different areas. And I don't necessarily mean that in a feel-good way because there is a right way to do something if your goal is to target your chest or your triceps or your shoulders or your pinky. But I've never tried pinky push-ups. But it's just good to understand, especially as we get more advanced, what we're doing and why we're doing it. And as you can see from this, if you bend your elbows more like this, there's a little bit more triceps engagement. And if you keep them almost perpendicular to the ground, there's less triceps engagement. Looks like we're doing some gardening, or as they call it, making pot. And I wanna add a bonus variation here. I know it's darker now, but my go-to example of an exercise done with bad form, back before I really started understanding more of what was going on, was a push-up variation where you really chicken-winged and you kind of T-posed and did a push-up like that. Now, some people naturally want to do this, and I suspect it's because, similar to how I felt about push-ups, they figure this is how a push-up is supposed to look, so they try to mimic that. Because at least for me, it never really felt comfortable. Now, no trainer I've ever met really considers that perfect push-up form. But the question is, is it wrong to do so? Because there are arguments for that. When we push like this, we tend to be in internal rotation, which is generally considered a more vulnerable position for us to be in. There might be other reasons, but generally when things are more stretched, there's more risk of injury to that area. But similar to our example about behind the back push-ups, what if we had always built up our push-ups like this? The equivalent to building up with five pound dumbbells, 10 pound dumbbells, 20 pound dumbbells, as we get stronger. Instead of weight, we can use different variations. Would that be okay? Theoretically, maybe. While the position looks awkward, all you're really doing is gradually increasing your ability to handle load in that position. But a different discussion that comes up is whether or not it's worth it to do that. Do you plan to ever be in this position? Are there better exercises that can work the muscles you want and get the benefits you want? And the answer is maybe, probably in this case. So while there aren't necessarily wrong and right exercises, there might be better and worse exercises depending on your goal. Okay, and we can use squats as an example for the lower body. Two major no-nos that some of us may have heard for squats is don't go below parallel and don't go knees over toes. But you can see that we're doing it here fairly regularly. Some people can do this just naturally first time they try, but we can certainly build up to this by assisting ourselves. Because nowadays we do understand there's nothing necessarily wrong with being in this position and squatting below parallel and going knees over toes, but we want to make sure we're acclimated to it. Meaning, once again, that if you're used to squatting huge weight up here, 200 pounds, 300 pounds, 500 pounds, and you've never gone below parallel, you might not want to do that first time trying with 500 pounds. You can build up 
Assess yourself first, then do body weight, and then add weight. Something I've been saying more and more often nowadays is feel effort to where you can feel the strain of exercise, but you don't feel pain, especially in the joints. And as we see here, we can do the same thing with lunges, both knees over toes and well below parallel, as you can see. Actually, I like it when my hamstrings compress against my calves here, but these jeans are not the most flexible ones I own. I like the ones I can stretch. I feel very flexible in those. But something that is considered wrong that you may want to avoid, or at least think twice about, is sideways pressure on your knees. Your knees is considered a hinge joint. It's only supposed to go front and back. It's not really supposed to go sideways. So you may have heard a form cue that I like to have your knee go over your second toe as you're squatting. So knees, second toe, like this, and squats and lunges. And something that you may want to be careful of, especially if you're using heavy loads, is to avoid that knee collapse, or at least excess knee collapse, like this, when you're squatting. You don't want to go too far in, or really too far out, because this is all pressure in and out on your knee. The broadly accepted idea, at least for now, is to keep your knees relatively aligned. Now, I do know of some people, friends even, who are experimenting with this and training this kind of motion, but I'm not entirely sure of the reasoning for that. I do want to keep an open mind because I'm always learning, and five, 10 years from now, maybe everyone's doing that. But at least for now, and especially as you're starting out, knees align going over toes, second toe, as a rule of thumb, is something that I recommend. So you see the theme here with those three exercises. I try to give some form variations that might be considered good or bad, and I show that some of them are just used to target different body parts. And there are some other things that are considered good form, safe form, that you may want to heat a little bit more, or at least keep as a rule of thumb, or rule of big toe if you're doing squats. Okay, so through all of that, we understand that perfect form is actually Actually intentional form. It's not quite black and white, it depends on what we want to do. So what should we do from here? And the first thing, the most important thing, if you're at all confused or stressed about this, is to not stress about it. Especially if you're just starting off, you can start with whatever form you want. As long as you follow a basic structure of form, as discussed in this video, you can pretty much do your exercises with a wide variety of technique. Arms forward, arms back, big chicken, little chicken. Right? And then as you get more advanced and you want to explore different things and you make small tweaks, which just about everyone does, no matter how advanced, even if they have coaches, they start off with technique and they adjust it to suit them over time. And you can do the same thing. You might realize that you actually want a little more elbow flare. You might realize you want a little bit less elbow flare. You might realize that you like arch back pull-ups more than straight pull-ups. The goal of this video really wasn't to stress you out. It's actually the opposite because I've noticed that people like to start and they feel more comfortable with certain small variations in their technique, and these are usually almost always okay. If something is feeling comfortable for you, and you feel effort of exercise, but not pain, and you started from a good level, and you're getting stronger over time, that's usually good, stick to that, you can always make changes later. And second, through this discussion, we see that almost all human movement is scalable. Once again, we can start with something we can do, practice it regularly, and move on to harder variations as we get stronger. However, there are some relatively few exceptions. Middle splits are actually a good example. If you're ever wondering why some people rotate their feet out or lean a certain way when they're doing the middle splits. It's because otherwise their leg bone literally goes into their hip bone and it doesn't allow a passage. But other than examples like that, almost all natural human movement is scalable. However, while there's not necessarily wrong or right, in that sense, there might be better or worse depending on your goal. And third, I already touched on this, but whatever you decide to do, and especially if you make any changes, try to build up progressively. Start with something that you know you can do. Actually start below something that you know you can do and work your way up, especially if it's new range of motion, increased range of motion, a new technique. It's better to spend those one or two days, one or two sessions, three sessions, however long, rather than injure yourself and set yourself back. You might be very strong in some things, but just simply not used to other things. If you wanna see how I build up, I literally wrote a book about it last year. Here you can see a wonderful unbiased review. It shows you how I build up the things like push-ups if you're interested in that, but also shows how to build up the things like one-arm pull-ups if you're interested in going further than average. That's at hybridcalisthenics.com slash book. Check it out if you want. But if you don't want to spend the money or just don't like books, we have a free web version online with videos at hybridcalisthenics.com slash routine. It's free and you don't have to sign up anywhere. If you need help with fitness, we have a free board where anyone can ask questions to certified personal trainers who work with clients, and they're also friends of mine, at support.hybridcalisthenics.com. Just a free resource for now and a beta app for if you want it, it's called Hyper Calisthenics on the App Store and Play Store. Thanks for watching and have a beautiful day.